Um, our next speaker is Chuck Geyer, and he's done just some really wonderful work on how you may potentially use the sensitivity to rewards to improve adolescent behavior. And I'm really looking forward to um, his talk today. So please help me welcome Chuck. Thank you. So as I'm uh, queuing up my presentation here, I just wanted to say uh, thank you to, to Brad and to Bea, obviously, for, uh, for inviting me and for putting together this just amazing uh, a few days here, um, and I'm, I'm completely honored to be in with this uh, this just a fantastic group of, of researchers who I have um, followed since you know since early grad school, and I'm just I'm just really uh, really pleased to be a part of this. Um, and a special thank you to, to Bay. I mean, this is this is uh, I always feel like you know when we come back to Pittsburgh. So I'm from here originally, and I always feel like um, you know coming back to Pittsburgh is like coming to home and, and visiting my second mom. <laughs> Um, and she'll be the first to tell you that, too. Um, but uh, I, I, I really hope that everybody at some point in their lives has a, uh, you know, a mentor and a friend to look up to as much as, as I have with Bea. It's a really uh, just a fantastic um, uh, way to start a career. Um, OK, so let me, uh, let me uh, get started here. Um, and thank you for, for also to all of you in the audience for, for showing up today after that soul-crushing loss last night, right? <laughs> so when I, when I was younger, I, I, I had this, uh, I was, I was I, I'm still pretty into the Pirates and, and the Steelers and all these Pittsburgh teams. And uh, I, I would typically not talk to anybody before noon after a Pittsburgh loss. <laughs> so thankfully for my career, I've, I've been able to move past that a little bit here this morning. Um, but I wanted to uh, I want to talk a little bit about, about what we've been doing, uh, um, mostly with the stuff that we've been doing with Bass. And we're continuing on with, with uh, uh, some of the, the Really nice projects that we've, that we've uh, initiated uh, with her. So um, we are very interested in understanding the uh, the neurobiological processes, um, supporting the the transition uh, through adolescence to mature cognitive control behavior. Um, critical to understanding this transition is 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 to examine how reward and motivation influence behavior. Right now, while there's been significant advances in understanding of, the, of these processes in adults, um, you know. When we started this work, relatively few uh, studies had, had looked at this uh, in, in adolescents um, um, and, and reward processes in, in specifically, and, and really um, uh, less, even less about the mechanisms between reward and cognitive control systems. Um, and so today I'm going to present evidence uh, from a series of studies uh, indicating uh, adolescent-specific immaturities um, in specific aspects of reward and inhibitory control. So the um, this is the, these are the specimens that I, that I uh, investigate, right, uh, adolescents. Um, so as we, know, as we all know, you know, adolescence broadly refers to this transitional period between childhood and, and adulthood. Um, the boundaries, uh, you know, typically are around the onset of puberty um, and uh, with an end, adolescence ends with the, uh, typically with, the, with the, uh, the acquisition of adult social roles and behavior, right? So it's a cross-disciplinary uh, endeavor, for sure. Um, the precise sort of age ranges, of course, as we all know, are, are a bit blurrier. Um, and so for, for my talk today, I'm going to focus on 13 to 17 year olds uh, as, as my adolescent sample. Now, this is, this is a, a fascinating time of development, right? Um, I mean, they all are, to be honest, right? But uh, adolescence in particular is really interesting. So, you know, we see these, these, uh, these improvements in physical health, um, uh, in, the, in the cognitive control behavior. We see improvements in, in, in working memory ability and problem solving across lots of different domains, right? Um, we also see increases in, in risk-taking, uh, or in sensation-seeking and novelty-seeking um, and in risk-taking behaviors as well, right? Um, these, these um, as, as Dr. Spear has uh, so eloqu eloquently uh, uh, described, that, you know, th this is, these seem to be highly conserved behavioral traits, right? We see these across species, across cultures. Um, there's something really interesting going on here. Um, so, and one of the things that I like to sort of talk about in my, in my presentations here um, is that risk taking, you know, doesn't always have a negative connotation. I think you know Adriana um, nicely uh, described this. Um, there, you can have what, what you can kind of describe as adaptive risk taking, right? So, in some cases, this sort of increased sensation, increased you know risk taking behaviors in adolescence is a good thing, right? Um, it can enhance social status, as Adriana mentioned. It can sort of push 
you know, the, the developing individuals sort of out of the nest to explore, you know, novel social environments, novel um, areas in general, um, that, which can have potentially reproductive strategies, right? So a nice example, for example, is, you know, uh, of an adaptive risk taking is, is, a, is an adolescent who, you know, takes that leap and, and stands up in front of the, the student body and, and, and goes for, uh, for student council, right? So they're, they're taking a risk, they're trying to sort of enhance their, their social status. Um, Certainly, uh, there are maladaptive cases as well, right? So um, the sort of, I think my head will fit there kind of idea, right? Um, and we know that these, these negative consequences are, are not as, as you know, um, they're not the same. They're, they're, they're sort of more adaptive, I think, um, risk-taking behaviors uh, overall than, they're, than they're, they're maybe uh, maladaptive. But the consequences of maladaptive risk-taking are, are pretty dramatic, right? Um, so this, leads, this can lead to uh, you know, dramatic increases uh, and morbidity and mortality during this, during this range, and as, as Ron has, has described, um, this sort of health paradox of adolescence, right? This time of increasing physical health, you know, increasing cognitive control, but, a, um, but a, uh, this, this sort of stark contrast in terms of, of, of the, the uh, you know, the mortality rates in this, age, in this age range. So, so how can we understand, you know, at a neurobiological level, um, why this health paradox occurs, right? And importantly, how might, how might we sort of support or enhance participation um, in more adaptive risk-taking behaviors? Well, one of the, uh, one of the challenges that we face is the risk-taking is, 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 uh, is not a unitary construct, right? There are lots of, of behavioral manifestations of, of risk, you know, all the way from experimenting with drugs to, again, you know, running for, for treasurer in, 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 uh, in, uh, in grade school or, or elementary school, uh, high school. So we've taken the approach to, uh, to basically uh, consider risk-taking as the result of one or more decisions, okay? Um, which uh, themselves, which decisions themselves, can be sort of um, broken down into, into sort of more comp core component processes, right? Uh, principal among these uh, uh, being uh, reward and inhibitory control processes. Um, so in my, in my in talk today, as, as we move on, uh, I'm going to, to show you data from a number of studies that we've done um, that have really sort of focused on the interaction of these, of these processes. So, um, so we have taken the approach of, of using um, a, a pretty standard uh, a, uh, inhibitory control task and adding an incentive component to it. So we use the Anscott task, which was described uh, beautifully um, yesterday by Stefan and, uh, and by uh, Doug, um, where again, you know, participants, this is training with Bay, you, you always have to do this in your talks, right? So, so where you look, at the, you look at the fixation cross, it goes away, a flash appears, you're supposed to look in the opposite direction. Um, we added an incentive component to this, uh, so we, uh, in, our, in our initial studies, we added a, a monetary incentive. Um, so participants would see either a ring of dollar bills or a ring of pound signs, um, indicating to them that their performance on the subsequent trial would be either rewarded or, uh, or would have no contingency. Um, and this has been, uh, we, we've sort of you know, have, had uh, several iterations of this, of this uh, similar task. Um, what we found is that, you know, behaviorally, um, when we add a, a contingency, a reward contingency to the task, uh, performance improves. Uh, so we see, we see uh, decreases in the latency of the responses um, on correct Anscott trials, um, and we also see a, a, a dip in the, in the number of errors that the, the individuals make um, when there is a reward contingency at stake, right? Um, you know, when we look at the, uh, when we look at the brain, um, we've, we found some interesting results. Um, so here is, I'm showing you the, uh, the, the estimated time course um, from the, uh, the, the venture story atom in response to, uh, to the incentive cue. So what I wanted to really kind of focus on uh, right now is the black line, which is the adult response, and the red line, which is the, which is the adolescent response, okay? So during this sort of initial period, we see this increased activation in the uh, investor rate in adults, okay? Um, and so it just, and just as, a, uh, as a sort of precursor to some of the other time courses I'm going to show you, so I use a, um, I do not assume a hemodynamic response in my, uh, my estimation, so some of the time courses um, they're, they're data-driven time courses, so they're gonna, they're gonna, they may look a bit uh, obscure to people who are not used to looking at it. Um, but later in the trial, right, um, during the preparatory period, we see the opposite. So here we see the, a, a pretty dramatic increase um, in sort of the robustness of the adolescent response during, uh, during rewarded trials um, and a, a, a kind of a null response in the adults, okay? So, uh, you know, so when during the trial uh, we examine, we sort of probe the reward system seems to be really important. Now, importantly, um, we also see at this, during the same epoch, right, in, in adolescence, and there's a, there's a lot of data on the slide, so I'm just going to kind of uh, just give you the, the highlights. We see um, increased activation in areas that we know are critical for uh, performing the anti task correctly. Um, and it's, and there, it's, we show the highest activation on reward trials, 
right? So areas like the FEF, um, the inferior precentral sulcus, and so forth, we see increased activation um, during those time periods, right? So, um, so some of these, uh, you know, the earlier work, uh, we saw a delayed and then a robust uh, adolescent response in the ventral striatum, um, which is, you know, kind of, um, I think, sh shedding some, some um, uh, adding a different perspective to, to this sort of overactive adolescent um, reward responses, right? Um, and, and really sort of highlighting this idea that, that when we're probing it is important, um, and sort of under what conditions we're probing it is important. Um, and this increased preparatory period in ocular motor circuitry, um, particularly like in areas like FEF, as we, as we, as we talked about, uh, with, in, in, or as Doug talked about yesterday, um, really sort of seems to provide a potential mechanism, a potential process for how rewards uh, influence the, the behavior on this task and improve behavior, right? Sending uh, uh, projections down to these fixation neurons in, in, in brainstem. Now, um, you know, as, we, as we presented this work initially, um, almost uh, every presentation we, we got the question, well, Okay, well how do you know that the adolescent um, is valuing the reward the same way as adults, right? So, you know, adults have jobs, kids, or teen teens uh, may or may not, uh, they may, they may uh, uh, value the amount of money that they're working for uh, a bit differently, right? And that may, may, may lead to differences in the motivation on the, on the task. Um, and this is, this is an important consideration, right? So um, not only across development, but across all um, studies of reward. Um, so so we, we, we've, uh, Try to uh, you know at least take an initial stab at trying to um, to uh, address this issue. So uh, in in a, in a series of studies, um, we have attempted to minimize uh, the reward value for which participants are working. Okay, and we've done this in a couple different ways. So one, um, this is the, and these are sort of pre um, Angioscott task manipulations that we've done. Um, so one is the participants chose their own reward. Okay, so we had a uh, we had all the participants choose a, a gift card from various uh, locations, all the way from Home Depot to, to iTunes, right? Um, uh, uh, so they were working for something that they found sort of subjectively desirable, right? Um, so they chose a reward as opposed to just, you know, having a, a, a set monetary reward, okay? Um, second, we, we wanted to sort of, you know, uh, be a bit more abstract from the actual monetary value, and so, so participants were earning points rather than, um, than money per se on, on each trial. Um, and then uh, third, and we think this, is, this was a um, particularly important manipulation, um, we, we set the, the amount of points that were available. So we set a, we, we set a fixed range of points. Um, and we sort of called this a, a fixed economy in some sense, right? So the absolute zero was zero, and, and they could earn up to like about 200 or so points, right? So everybody was operating within this sort of the same range, okay? Which is a, which is a, a distinct difference from, from money, where you can have, you know, widely varying uh, sort of reference points, if you will, right? Um, so a bit about the, the task, we've uh, we sort of we modified the, the incentive queue a bit. Um, here we have uh, green bars above a fi fixation point, uh, indicating potential to, uh, to, to win points, uh, and red bars uh, below to indicate uh, potential to loss of points, depending on their, their subsequent performance. Um, and we varied the, uh, the number of bars above and below to indicate these differences in magnitude, right? Um, so we had 110 participants, uh, 64 adolescents, and 46 um, adults uh, perform this task. Um, and importantly, we had some, um, some algorithms um, that were able to uh, provide the subjects immediate feedback based on where they're looking at on the screen, okay? So if they, if they made a correct interest card task, uh, hopefully this works, they heard this sound. Did you guys hear that? Cha-ching. <laughs> and if they did it wrong, they heard this task. Right? Um, and incidentally, the, uh, the adolescents uh, reported, uh, several adolescents reported that they, they were working hard to avoid that buzz sound, which is interesting. Um, so what we found behaviorally was that, um, you know, we asked them to rate how valuable they, they found the reward. Um, adolescents and adults did not differ behaviorally in terms of how valuable they rated their, 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 their chosen reward, okay? When we look at the, uh, their performance, um, we found that, um, particularly for, for reward magnitudes, as the reward magnitude went up, um, the adolescents became more and more uh, adult-like in their, in their behavioral uh, appearance, right? Um, so at these high reward values, they were performing at, at adult-like levels and really high uh, error rates. Um, this is 2.5, but it's just a uh, typo. Um, for loss magnitude, everybody was doing really well. Um, everybody uh, was, you know, perhaps again, because they were trying to avoid hearing that sound, right? Even the, the adolescents were, were doing well. Um, so adolescents reached adult levels of control and trials with higher reward magnitudes. Um, so to, to summarize uh, this, this, uh, this paper, um, you know, adults can show 
uh, mature levels of inhibitory control when, when in this context we're in which we've enhanced the salience of the rewards and we've minimized our value differences, okay? Um, so we took this task in the scanner. Um, the participants performed the behavioral version first and then they uh, saw the, uh, um, this task. Um, we had, uh, this is just an outline of the, of the, uh, the experiment. Um, we included uh, jittered inner trial intervals and um, uh, catch trials. Um, we'll talk about this later, but essentially to assure that there was a sufficient number of independent linear equations to uniquely estimate the bold response to each epoch. Okay? Um, so they also heard feedback in the scanner as well. Um, so we have 114 subjects um, in this, in this, task, in this um, data set of adults and adolescents. Um, I'm going to show you, we've, we've done, we've analyzed this data, you know, um, uh, six ways to Sunday, and we're going to, uh, I'm going to show you some of the uh, sort of, sort of, um, initial uh, analyses where we're focusing on the um, mean activation across uh, a priori regions of interest, okay? Um, so we, we perform both a, uh, a deconvolution response or deconvolution analysis with, uh, with an assumed shape uh, and also with, without an assumed shape. Um, and I'm going to show you data um, that kind of show both. So behaviorally, um, we're seeing that adults um, are performing really well across tasks. Um, adolescents are improving on, uh, on reward relative to neutral. Um, and we're seeing a slight, you know, a close to significant uh, difference in terms of how the, the adults perform as relative uh, on loss relative to neutral. So if I can just kind of walk through quickly some of the results. Um, in the sense of Q, uh, we see that there, in this task, uh, there were no differences in, in terms of how the adolescents and adults responded in the ventral striatum, right? Um, so, very similar responses. This is in contrast to what I showed you in the, in the first study, right, in which the ad adults were, were highly active. Um, some other areas uh, of interest, so I'm just to quickly walk you through here. So this, these are the, the, the mean beta estimates um, from these regions. These are the time courses uh, without error bars, just to kind of give you a sense of the, of the overall shape, right? Um, but we did find some group differences um, in the SEF, um, in which the adults seem to have a bit more positive going activation. Um, the patamen, uh, a similar kind of response. Um, and in the left posterior parietal cortex, uh, we saw this sort of interesting representation of the, uh, the incentive type, right? So whereas adults seem to uh, basically uh, you know, activate the PPC equally across the phenotypes, the adolescents showed this sort of gradual decline, particularly for neutral trials, which we thought was interesting. So in, in, the, in the context of this task, right, so in this task in which they were choosing their own reward, had this fixed values kind of stuff, um, we saw similar initial response in the ventral striatum. Um, the SEF and patamen activation uh, indicates sort of this early potential differential sensitivity to how the incentive cue was assessed, right? Um, and this PPC activity um, may reflect this uh, differential sensitivity to, uh, or differences across the incentive types in the opportunity for rewards, sort or of how much perhaps attention they're paying to the, the reward. Okay. Um, limited time here, so I'm going to go glance through here uh, pretty quickly. So uh, when we look at the preparatory period, okay, so again, here's, here's the response to the queue, okay? So relatively, you know, relatively limited across the age groups, no differences. When we look at the preparatory period in um, we're seeing this heightened activation, right? And in this task, we're seeing that the adults are showing greater activation, right? Um, so again, there, this, is, this, is, this is distinct from our, our initial findings, right, in the Geyer uh, 2010 paper. Um, so in the context of this task, we're showing greater activation. Um, and, uh, and incidentally, uh, this is interesting because uh, I was talking to, uh, to David Paulson, one of the postdocs, who's, uh, who's doing some really great work on this, uh, on the longitudinal data set. Um, and for, for whatever reason, the, uh, there, there seems to be a, some differences in how the adolescents are, are, are valuing the, uh, the reward when they're doing this a second time. So they're, they're sort of devaluing the reward um, that they're working for, um, which, which sort of bears out well in this, in this data. Um, in the SEF, we're seeing some group differences. I'm going to kind of skip through this a little bit. F FEF, similar. So, um, so adolescents um, showing, uh, or adults are showing greater ventral striatum during the preparatory period, similar activation in FEF, right? Um, and in fact, this, the FEF activation was significantly related to, to the performance on the task as well, right? And then just to, to conclude here with the saccade response, um, we're seeing uh, widely similar differences in the, in the saccade epic. Uh, and this is also the period when they're hearing the feedback. Okay, so in ventral striatum, we're seeing very similar responses. Again, um, in dorsal ACC, similar responses. Um, in FEF, we're seeing a bit of a difference, um, particularly during the neutral trials, which I think is very interesting, right? Um, so there's a, a, 
Okay. Largest similar, uh, uh, <laughs> I got my, my cue. Um, <laughs> largest similar response profiles across most of, most of their ROIs. So on, on average, these guys are doing pretty much the same, but there are sort of distinct differences, okay? Um, but there's greater activation in FEF relative to, in, on, incentive, on neutral trials, which may indicate the differences in ways that the, the adults and adolescents are sort of perceiving the neutral cue relative to other things, everything else, okay? And so just, just to end with some quick take homes, um, the reward sensitivity uh, in venture straight and reward response in, in, in venture straight appears to be sensitive to context. Okay, we've changed context. We've seen different different patterns of activation. Um, we're seeing some some evidence for um, for different uh, profiles of responses in ocular motor and, and control and reward circuitry um, it, during this 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 endeavor of motivated inhibitory control. Uh, and we think that this is this is sort of helping us. You know, eventually going to help us understand how. Um, these sort of basic brain processes that are supporting more uh, complex decision making may contribute to, to risk behaviors. So and that's it. And I'll